thank you, uh, friends, for having me, and good evening to you all. Um, it's really just an honor and a delight to be here. I visited the parish for the first time a few months ago and worshiped with you all on Sunday morning and was um, just blessed to be part of the tradition here. So thank you. And I think this new lecture series is wonderful. Can you hear me? Great. So, my slightly expanded title now has a, is, Who are my mother and brothers? Question mark. Catholic configurations of race. <coughs> then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. The crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel text, which we heard last Sunday, presents the reorienting familial and tribal claims of the Gospel. Who are my mother and brothers? The answer is all who follow God, all who obey God, all God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, from every nation and people across time and space, a vast company of those called who have sought and found him. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me out of all my terror. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not stray from your commandments. This is the Catholicism of the gospel a new map of loyalties and loves and intimate association, centered on the person of Jesus himself, sent by God to save the world through his cross and passion. The seeming paradox that Jesus came from a particular place, Nazareth, born of Mary, to accomplish this universal mission must be of primary interest, and I will accordingly turn to it, first with the help of James Cohn, the great innovator of black theology in the United States, and then Alan Rohan Kreit, the celebrated Anglo-Catholic liturgical artist and documentarian of African-American urban life in Boston, who was also a theologian in his own right. Both men wondered deeply about the story and promise of the scriptures, according to which one descended from David becomes the desire of the nations hence the desire of black Americans. And both men followed the clue of a Christological reordering of time and identity according to the peculiar pattern of God's love revealed by the crucifixion and resurrection. Race can and must be figured, refigured and configured within the same pattern, the pattern of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. I speak to you in his name. So James, James Cohn's Black Christ. James H. Cohn, the great founder of black liberation theology, who taught for most of his career down the street at Union Seminary, and who passed away recently, uh, thought a great deal about the matter before us, namely a proper Christian configuring of race tied to Jesus Christ. I'd like to set out here some key aspects of Cohn's picture in his important 1975 book, God of the Oppressed, before coming to the feature presentation, as it were. Early on, Cohn specifies the basic terms and contours of what he calls black theology as a dynamic comb combination of black experience, scripture, and Jesus Christ. The tradition and history of Western Christianity are not thereby set aside, says Cohn, but they must be approached, quote, in the light of the word disclosed in Scripture as interpreted by black people. And this means for Cohn placing the humiliation and abuse of Jesus at the center of the gospel and allowing it to orient all properly and fully Christian theology, worked out in obedience to Scripture and the facts of the matter revealed in Jesus' life. To be sure, Cohn insists that only Jesus Christ is the truth, and he accordingly stands in judgment over all statements about truth. 
That said, and Cohn viewed this as paradoxical, quote, There is no truth in Jesus Christ independent of the oppressed of the land, their history and culture. And in America, Cohn continues, the oppressed are the people of color, black, yellow, red, and brown. Indeed, it can be said that to know Jesus is to know him as revealed in the struggle of the oppressed for freedom. Their struggle is Jesus' struggle, and he is thus revealed in the particularity of their cultural history, their hopes and dreams of freedom. Such a reorienting hermeneutic brings with it an associated criterion of orthodoxy for Cohn, hence also a contrasting heresy. As Cohn explains, Heresy here refers to any activity or teaching that contradicts the liberating truth of Jesus Christ. Heresy is the refusal to speak the truth or to live the truth in the light of the one who is the truth. And the point, of course, bears upon communities and not only individuals. As, quote, as Cohen says, quote, When does the church cease to be the church of Jesus Christ? When do the church's actions deny the faith that it verbalizes? Can the Church of Jesus Christ be racist and Christian at the same time? Can the Church of Jesus Christ be politically, socially, and economically identified with the structures of oppression and also be a servant of Christ? Unquote. Cohn allows that while these questions may be easy to answer theoretically, they are very difficult to answer concretely. All the more in a society of many denominations under an ethos of the freedom of religion. One need not be an enthusiastic hunter of heretics, however, he says, to appreciate the point that the point bears on the church's own life, its work and consciousness, as these are properly centered on the community of the oppressed in accord with the gospel itself. <coughs> Several chapters on, Cohn turns to the question, who is Jesus Christ for us today? and starts to put his finger very helpfully on the main question of my own concern, the matter of race tied to the particularity of Jesus and the universality of his saving gospel. The question obviously goes to the heart of the Christian faith and the identity of the church as a community across space and time, presuming some coherence in what Christians have always understood themselves to be about. How does this dynamic work? For Cohn, it has precisely to do with what he calls the importance of Jesus' racial identity, set within a wider arc of God's salvific pedagogy or teaching. That is the way in which God saves by reorienting our sense of order and justice. As Cohn explains, quote, Jesus was a Jew. The particularity of Jesus' person disclosed in his Jewishness is indispensable. Through the divine election of Jesus the Jew as the means of human salvation, Yahweh makes real the divine promise that through Abraham, all the families of the earth shall bless themselves, basic to the Old Testament, in order to keep the divine promise to make Israel a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, Yahweh became a Jew in Jesus of Nazareth, thereby making possible the reconciliation of the world to himself, 1 Corinthians 5.19. Jesus' Jewishness, therefore, was essential to his person. He was not a universal man, but a particular Jew who came to fulfill God's will to liberate the oppressed, unquote. That being so, it follows for Cohn that we are now required to affirm the blackness of Jesus Christ as Christologically valid. As Cohn explains, it is on the basis of the soteriological meaning of the particularity of his Jewishness, that theology must affirm the Christological significance of Jesus' present blackness. It's a mouthful. He is black because he was a Jew, says Cohen. That is, Jesus' very identity as the Christ of Israel, the Messiah, is tied to the universality of God's plan as a promise of salvation for all the nations, wrought through Jesus' cross and resurrection, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon. The point for Cohn is at once deeply theological and contextual. As he says, if we assume that the risen Lord is truly present with us as defined by his past history and witnessed by scripture and tradition, 
What then does his presence mean in the social context of white racism? To ask this question is to admit, as Cohn says, that blackness as a Christological title may not be appropriate in every human context, even in the present, but it is fitting, quote, in the contemporary social existence of America. If we Americans, black and white, are to understand, this is Cohn, if we Americans, black and white, are to understand who Jesus is for us today, we must view his presence as continuous with his past and future coming, which is best seen through his present blackness. Thus, this is my last quotation from Cohn, no gospel of Jesus Christ is possible in America without coming to terms with the history and culture of that people who struggled to bear witness to his name in extreme circumstances. To say that Christ is black means that God, in his infinite wisdom and mercy, not only takes color seriously, he takes it upon himself and discloses his will to make us whole, new creatures born in the spirit of divine blackness and redeemed through the blood of the black Christ. Well, if we're interested in seeing, in seeing Christ's present blackness and the blackness of all the saints and holy ones of Scripture, then we need look no further than the work of Alan Rohan Crite, sometimes called the greatest African American artist of the 20th century. Crite lived a long life. He was born in 1910 and died in 2007. 97 years, years old, and enjoyed a similarly long career, spanning eight decades of productivity from the 1930s through the aughts of the 2000s. He was already doing public work in the 30s. His work incorporates multiple media, oil, watercolor, ink, graphite, linoleum. He published numerous books and often exhibited his work from when he was a young man right to the end. The son of a poet, his mother, and a doctor and an engineer, his father, Crite was accepted into Yale, but turned them down in order to study at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts in Boston, from which he graduated in 1936. Today, his work hangs in the Smithsonian, Boston's Museum of Fine Arts, and the Art Institute of Chicago, and in many churches, uh, Catholic, mostly Catholic and Episcopal, uh, in the Northeast. Already in the 30s, Crite was immersed in a Catholic style of religious drawings, which was a conscious decision and commitment he made as a young man in his teens. Crite had grown up at an Episcopal parish with a low liturgy, but became, quote, convinced, as he said, about the liturgy of the Catholic expression of Christianity, incorporating its doctrine of the Eucharist, priesthood, and episcopate. This happened when he was a teenager. He considered the priesthood for a time, but remained a layman. He immersed himself, however, during this time in his teens, this time he called it his Catholic revival, in the study of the church and its liturgies, Roman and Anglican, East and West. He did so not for merely religious reasons, he said, but as a matter of personal devotion and deeper conversion to God. As Crite explained in a wide-ranging oral history interview with Robert Brown of the Smithsonian, uh, over a period of 21 months, in 1979 to 1980, the whole thing is recorded. And it's, uh, the transcript is like 175 pages. It's a very, very interesting piece of oral history. Um, Crite tells the story of, of, of himself as a young, incipient Anglo-Catholic, um, assisting at a Christmas Mass in Boston after the passing of a friend's father, who had been a Baptist minister. And he, he admits he had a crush on the girl who was the daughter of the pastor. So it's a personal connection that way. Um, he said he regretted not marrying her, um, his first love. Um, he was there assisting at the Christmas Mass of the Episcopal Church, thinking about the Baptist minister who just died. And he had a kind of mystical vision. Um, and he very humbly said, you know, I'm, I'm no mystic, but this is just, this is the one time it happened, but I had a kind of 
mystical vision at St. Bartholomew's Church in Cambridge, a black Episcopal church. He says, at the consecration, I had this sense that behind the altar, there was this presence of the Christ child and the mother. It was a vivid impression. I didn't see anything like that. It was just something that I sensed. He, pro he proceeded to try to capture his impression and included uh, in a picture, in a drawing. This is his first religious piece of liturgical art. And included, he included in it, naturally, the complete vestments, the priest in the chasuble, the subdeacon behind what is known as the humeral veil. He explains all this in the interview, in, in which he holds the paten. This is the moment when the bread is consecrated. This is what I tried to show, to get all the glory of the altar, the angels, the whole thing, unquote. I tell that story because it's a little bit of an insight into the heart of this man as a young man and why he began doing liturgical art. He celebrated for all his many different kinds of art. Um, one, he did all these street scenes in Boston um, of sort of middle-class black life, which was one of his passions. Um, he said he was sort of tired of pictures always being just of like sort of jazz musicians or people in, in the Harlem Renaissance. He wanted kind of ordin the ordinary... Uh, you know, middle-class folks that he grew up with who went to church and so forth. And so they're wonderful street scenes. And uh, they, this, uh, a, a, a museum in um, Seattle put this book together a few years ago when they did an exhibit of his work. And I thought I'd pass it around to you. It's from the General Seminary Library. And dropping right in the middle of it, he, he, he loves, he's, you can see his angle of Catholicism. There are a couple of, he, he loves Marian apparitions. And it's always with Mary and Jesus, and it's a black Mary and a black Jesus. So this is on Broughton Street in the South End, where he grew up. Right there. Bookmark there. Um, he just kind of, he's, he, the church is always present in all of those neighborhood paintings. So that's being secular, celebrated by a secular museum in, in recent years. Um, but he also, um, uh, there's another book, too, that I won't really uh, speak about much, but I want to point it out to you, and you can buy it online for very cheaply. This would make a great gift for any Anglo-Catholic priest. Um, maybe some of you know, it's called All Glory, Brush Drawings, Medita Brush Drawing Meditations on the Prayer of Consecration. And it's right one. And I made four photocopies of some of the best shots, and they're in that packet I gave you. And they're in the back. And it's, you'll notice it's a, it's a black priest. The angels have black faces. God the Father is black. Jesus is black. In some several cases, God the Father's hands are just these like, huge, massive hands coming down and blessing it all. Uh, the Holy Spirit is a, is a white dove. Um, and underneath, he's got, he, he does, it's a very sort of pious um, illustration of the whole Eucharistic prayer. It's really just beautiful. Um, and you pick up that sort of Anglo-Catholic devotion of the, of the time. Um, I'm not going to speak about that. I'm going to speak about four other images that I also handed out to you. Um, so, his liturgical art, what he called his liturgical art, he produced mostly for mainline churches, especially Episcopal and Catholic, in a variety of media. Drawing, block print, illustration, painting... And then he partnered with a, um, a, um, a, a maker of materials, whatever you call that kind of person, artist, uh, collaborated to make chasubles and altar frontals. And she did the sewing, and he would do the kind of design work. Um, he also did an interesting mosaic for a Roman Catholic Franciscan community in uh, Washington, D.C., I want to focus mainly on Wright's important 1948 book, Three Spirituals from Earth to Heaven, uh, published by Harvard University Press. You can actually buy that inexpensively online as well, but I couldn't bring it because it's a rare book at general. It's, um, it's in kind of tough shape. The book takes up three classic spirituals. Nobody Knows the Trouble I See, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, and Going to Shout All Over God's Heaven called simply by Christ, heaven. And it moves through the lyrics page by page as if in a children's book. It's a substantial book. It's maybe 80 pages long with 80 different drawings. 
it, it would really be very fitting for children of an appropriate age, introducing them to these spirituals. Wright had grown up hearing his formerly Baptist mother sing these spirituals, uh, but here adopts a sustainably Catholic liturgical imagery for the illustrations, which is the remarkable kind of thing he does. Um, the, the sort of introducing these cultures to each other in, 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 intentionally. Consider first the two images I've provided. Unfortunately, of course, I messed up the photocopying, so you have to like flip it around as you go. But the first image on the front page um, says along the bottom, Nobody Knows But Jesus. That's from the song, Nobody Knows the Trouble I See. And if you flip that over, the one on the back says, Glory. Are you all with me? First two pages. So I'm just going to, this is Christ's commentary on those two images. I want you to just give, get a sense of what he was going for there. You can look at them. In this spiritual, this song, nobody knows, uh, nobody knows the trouble I, I see, is what he, how he says it. In this spiritual, the melody is set forth by the single overall clad figure. The accompaniment, in our first picture, that's the man on the left. The accompaniment is shown by the chorus in the background which acts as a foil to enhance the drama of the main motif. You see the chorus in the background, that eight or ten people. This arrangement brings out the basic truth of the hymn, that no one can know our troubles as we do, save him, capital H, who knows us more intimately than we know ourselves. In the last five drawings, and these are from those last five drawings, the chorus is doubled and is vested in copes. You can see in the back. This is done, this is, I'm quoting right here, this is done to denote the swelling in the volume of music as the, as the um, spiritual rises in passion, which remains a climax when our Lord is shown vested as prelate and king. That's on the next second one. Glory. You see Jesus. In the first image, Jesus is guiding you. In the second image, Jesus has, is now vested as prelate and king. The general character of this hymn is one of sadness at the immediate surroundings, but not discouragement. This is still Christ. For all through the hymn, there is a, the note of faith, a faith which carries one on to the eventual triumph, hence the use of a crown of thorns. I'm so excited about that spiritual... surmounted by a jeweled crown. You see in the second image there, Christ as king, but he's still got the crown of thorns on. Showing triumph over adversity. Through the troubled atmosphere of the hymn and its contemplation of a troubled world, a note of hopefulness is constant, evidenced by the frequent calls upon Jesus with the triumphant end, the motif figure in complete union with our Lord in the glory. Hallelujah. For Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, the second one, I provided just one image uh, from the end. It says at the bottom, coming for to carry me. In which one can see again a wonderful tableau of Catholic imagery explained by Christ in his introduction. To the front left, the back of an angel wearing an owl, dalmatic, and stole. As Christ explains, heaven, our home, the destination of the little old man on the right, is indicated by the altars. See that at the top, very top of the image, the candlestick and the folks, and he's heading towards the altar in heaven. For in the church, the altar in the sanctuary represents the church triumphant, the church in heaven. 
In this final drawing, the angels are shown leaving the little old man, indicating that the destination has been reached and he is about to enter into the joys of his Lord. The last image, uh, it says at the bottom, gods. This is because he's exegeting these, the lyrics, frame by frame, so in the context of it, it makes sense as you're sort of turning the page like a picture book. This image, quote, gods, is drawn from the end of the song, Going to Shout All Over, God's Heaven. And you'll note the image of the woman kneeling down on the front left, about to be crowned before King Jesus. The crowning uh, really picks up the focus of the third verse of the song. I've got a crown, you've got a crown, all God's children got a crown. When I get to heaven, I'm going to put on my crown. And Christ provides this piece of spiritual commentary. Quote, in these last drawings, the saints are in solemn procession before the throne of our Lord, who, again, is vested as prelate and king, having all authority both in heaven and earth. Surrounding our Lord are the hosts of heaven. The winged, wheel-type angels are the thrones, whose duty is to uphold the throne of God. Closest to our Lord are the seraphim, reflecting the love of God. And further away are the cherubim, reflecting God's wisdom. Thus the hierarchy of the nine choirs of angels is shown. Mm. The entire character of this hymn reflects the faith, faith in the unspeakable joys of the beatific vision. It is filled with the holy gaiety of the saints. Well, let me draw some strands together briefly. Kreitz's understanding of race is certainly reflected and documented in his drawings and art, but he did address it from time to time as well, including in the long oral history interview of 1980. On his steady preference for black characters in all his work, Kreitz explained that in his neighborhood paintings, he liked to depict the people he saw around him. For the spirituals, it seemed fitting for the particular story of black people. The latter, however, naturally blends into Kreitz's third usage, namely his preference for black figures for all his spiritual and religious art. Here we might find an echo of Cone, perhaps, in a more constructive idiom. The black figure as, these are Kreitz's words, the story of man beyond, you might say, the parochial racial idea, unquote. Here, Kreit intended to sell, tell a single story of humankind by lifting up the heritage, as he says, the heritage of the black peoples in the Americas as part of the heritage of the peoples all over the world. All of us have to understand it. While there is the struggle to get free from slavery as far as the black person is concerned, there is also the struggle to be free of that same slavery, as far as the white person is concerned. Because both are bound into the same thing. No one is free if anyone is not free. Freedom is indivisible. The difficulty that we have, this is still quite speaking, is that there's a kind of illusion that slavery only affects black people, whereas in fact, in fact, all of us have been enslaved. Unquote. In both cases, we should find here a Catholic comprehensiveness in keeping with the vision of worship and sacrament, the worship of the heavenly Jerusalem to which all of Christ's liturgical art was devoted, a commitment that is to sustained transformation, incorporating politics and society. Just here, Christ's sacramental figuralism reaches beyond the bounds of the institutional church to imagine and propose God's own transformative work in the world. Wright set forth uh, his views in this field from the 1960s on, initially in a paper entitled The Cultural Heritage of the United States, a Rediscovery, proposing a retrieval of all the art of the United States, 
in the conviction that we are already bound to one another. As he put it later, our roots are here in America through the Indians, and our roots are in Africa. Our roots are also in Europe, but they're our roots. You see, what I'm saying is America, culturally speaking, is the result of an Afro-European culture on top of an Indian base. This is where all our roots are for everybody. And for us to understand ourselves, we have to understand all the different parts of ourselves. The Americas in general, the U.S. in particular, are a tremendous repository of African tradition, which has an influence on every person who walks around here. We're influenced by the music, by the way we walk, and everything like that. And the same thing is true as far as the Indian is concerned. These are sort of living traditions which are continuously changing and moving along with the European. One should also say Euro Eurasian. These are living things which influence every single person here. It isn't a case of saying to a person who's Anglo-Saxon, my roots are in England, or over in England, and that's it. Because he's influenced by everything else that's happened. In this spirit, Christ was committed to integration. Not, however, as an absorption. And he wanted to speak truly about the reality of things. As he put it, we've been an integrated society from the beginning. And as we look at the American colony, there was a mixture of different European groupings, different Indian groups, different African groups, all formed together to make this single society. That's been the nature of the American experience, and it's a very rich one. He doesn't like to speak of integration because it makes it sound like we're not already uh, all bound up with one another, including by blood, as he says. A couple final thoughts. T.S. Eliot, another great Anglo-Catholic from a very different part of the, from a different uh, uh, subculture within Anglicanism, in his discussion of the sociology of sect and cult, wants Christians to invest in rich cultures and subcultures of literature, art, and devotion. They're not flattened or homogenized. This is in his notes towards the definition of culture. Yes, he says, we must avoid a simple identification of religion and culture. At our most imperious, we make many errors and commit many crimes, he says. But imagining the reunion of all Christians, we ought not seek a uniformity of culture. Rather, a reunified church would include a variety of local cultures which would and should vary very widely indeed. Why? Because we are bound to note the fruitfulness of multiple forms for which the doctrine of providence provides a ready theological alibi. In England, he says, Methodism, in the period of its greatest fervor, revived the spiritual life of the English and prepared the way for the evangelical movement within the C of E, and even for the Oxford movement. Accordingly, Eliot concludes, it would seem that a constant struggle between the centripetal and centrifugal forces is desirable. For without that struggle, no balance can be maintained. And he goes on, Christendom should be one, but within that unity there should be an endless conflict between ideas. For it is only by the struggle against constantly appearing false ideas that the truth is enlarged and clarified, and in the conflict with heresy that orthodoxy is developed to meet the needs of the times. An echo of James Cone from a different earlier voice. Eliot uh, continues, an endless effort also on the part of each region to shape its Christianity to suit itself, an effort which should neither be wholly suppressed nor wholly left unchecked. If we find this to be true, as I do, we should still add, nonetheless, that the United States today, uh, or modern-day Britain, for that matter, in the United States today, or as in Britain, local cultures are rarely associated with what Eliot calls regions. Um, this family, famously, is what, in our case, is what makes the United States very different from most parts of the world as a land of immigrants incorporating the history of slavery and the earlier indigenous populations, as Craig insisted. A complicated place, therefore, formed by complicated histories of sin 
and concomitant extraordinary breakthroughs, and anticipation perhaps at our best of the flux of the kingdom of God on its way to Pentecost, but still chased by the tragedy of Babel. Just this vision of a new kingdom and new community, a Pauline vision of one body with many members, none identical, all in need of each other, animated Christ's thinking explicitly. Here he spoke of the real tragedy of segregation, that we cut ourselves off from each other and cut ourselves off from the gifts that each of us has. The more when we are already quite literally interrelated, interrelated by blood. In cutting off one part of ourselves from another part of ourselves, we hurt ourselves. He says, this country has an enormous opportunity. We have all the technical power and so forth, and we have one of the richest inheritances of any people throughout the whole world. <clears throat> if we wake up to the fact that we can share it with each other, we could have a cultural renaissance around here, the likes of which the world has never seen. This, I would add, is the work of enculturating the gospel. Yes, in every land and nation, and among every people across time and space, also in every neighborhood and city and country, as difficult as this will be, in service of what Eliot calls an ecumenism of common faith. As Christians formed by the cross and resurrection, the work will necessarily reflect Jesus Christ himself, in whom we live and move and have our being. And it will be possible to complete only by his power, as he tramples down sin, death, and alienation. This new life may be found now, as well, we believe and profess, in the visible body of the Church. And as Alan Kreitz so powerfully demonstrated, it may be hoped for in the Church triumphant, for which we pray. In just this primary work of holy prayer, the heart of Catholicism may be given and received as a great formative gift for our cities and our nation, for the world still divided as it is, as a witness to the vying and warring nations, and not least for the salvation of our own souls. So, James H. Cohn, Alan Rohan Kreit, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Joseph, and all the saints who have gone before, pray for us that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Thank you. Amen. so for some questions. Now here's the beautiful, intimate way we're going to do the questions tonight. There's a microphone right to the left of Dr. Wells. You can ask your questions, sit down in the first pew and have a little conversation with Dr. Wells. Uh, so, and that, and that way also we have people signed in on Facebook Live. That's why we're using the microphone so they can hear uh, what this question is. So if you have a question, come up to the microphone. And I can start off with this while people are thinking. Um, I, I would, I'm, I'm interested if uh, <laughs> Cohen and Wright uh, are, are around the same period. Were they in, did they interact in any way? If they didn't, I'm, I'm curious if Cohen would have been critical of Wright in some way because Wright has this expressive, um, triumphant kind of vision for Black America, and Cohen's vision is kind of you know, hey, we've been oppressed. Mm -hmm. and, keep, and he keeps it there a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how you read them both and maybe if they didn't interact. Well, that's a great question. And I would welcome, you know, corrections and contributions from others. And I don't know if my friend who wrote a dissertation on James Cohn is watching on Facebook, but he could, uh, he could certainly say a lot. Professor Cameron perhaps knows him, knew, knew his work very well as well from Union. Um, I will say I've read God of the Oppressed, but I'm not a Cone scholar. Um, part of the reason I put them next to one another is the contrast in piety and culture. And it's interesting the way Kreit, and I, I, particularly in the um, Spirituals book, which I um, focused on, putting together kind of the, the, the experience of uh, black American Christians 
coming out of slavery and kind of an evangelical and Baptist culture, reading, reading that through the lens of Anglo-Catholic liturgy, and he was very articulate about what he was doing, I and mean, he just, he loved them both, and he wanted them to know one another. And he said, you know, I want my Baptist friends and family members to be a little bit off balance by all the Catholic stuff, um, to be blessed by it. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't some kind of triumphal, I don't think, he didn't have a rich kind of, or rigorous account of like the history of Western Christianity and its sins or something. So I, I can imagine that perhaps, you know, James, that James Cone in his most, in these early days, I mean, this was like his third book, I think, but he's still kind of slugging it out in this book to try to establish black theology as a legitimate discourse. Mm -hmm. And he's partly trying to be provocative because I think he felt a great burden to, to lead the way on some of that. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the, I know that the later Cone moves into a whole bunch of different um, fields and, and, and my, my friend... Matthew, Father Matthew Burdett thinks that the early cone is really the more the more richly theological and, and Christianly um, dense cone. And, and the stuff I quoted, I wasn't meaning really to take over. I think I found a lot of usefulness in all of that first part of cone. I'm not sure I found anything to object to on sort of traditional or Catholic grounds. Um, except that, of course, when he says when he, when he proposes this new her heresy um, that he obviously wants to argue about. And he rightly says, um, once you're doing heresy and orthodoxy, you're inviting an argument about doctrine. And so I return to that with Eliot, partly to say that's the right question. And that's always a legitimate question for Christian theologians to ask. You know, what is heresy? What is orthodoxy now? And for Cohn, the, the heresy that he was identifying was docetism. So sort of a, a Christ that just appears uh, to be sort of a man or a saving person, but actually um, isn't really fully like us. Um, but also really part of what I was trying to get at is I wanted to give a full-throated theological defense, and you're patient to listen to it, because maybe you worked this out a long time ago, of, of why we should welcome black icons of Jesus or Mary or of the saints and why that isn't kind of a historical problem. Because I think a lot of people might trip over that and say, like, well, Jesus wasn't black, was he? Or Mary wasn't black, so isn't that kind of historically a mistake? Um, and I wanted to kind of defend that. Those are just a few thoughts. Sorry if that was too long. Um, As I was listening to your wonderful presentation and looking at that art, which I did not know about, I was thinking how this church incarnates a process, this, this particular church incarnates a process. And I was thinking when it was first built and founded in the 1880s, uh, the people were pretty much all white. English and German, and then the Italians came, and then black people came, and then Puerto Ricans came, and then Dominicans came, and then Mexicans came, and, and how interesting it is to see a church that has had populations wash in, and all of them remain in some sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then I was looking around uh, at the decorative element of, of our beautiful church here and wondering where the black bits are. Uh, and uh, I think that's a question that might well be asked and uh, perhaps answered. Anyway. Thank you. Question is in a sense 
built on that diversity. We do have actually some brown faces here. That's right, there's the Virgin uh, are to be Guadalupe. represented by the Virgin of Guadalupe, mm -hmm. and indeed, you know, a memorial to a young girl who died at a very early age. But thinking about this parish and thinking about its many levels of participation and its many cultural mixes, um, I'm also thinking that the Episcopal Church still does not seem to have the same configuration. Right. Indeed, you see that a lot of the mainline churches, Episcopal or Presbyterian, if you look at their demographics, their census population, they're often 80 to 90 percent white. Right. And therefore, uh, you know, there's a ways to go on this. So I guess my question, even in the absence of a black icon, because actually we have the iconography in the congregation. Um, what are the windows that a Catholic tradition allows you know, people to come in or the doors that you know, allow this kind of population to be configured, not just location, but are there some specifics? And do they relate to Christ? Yeah. Is it, let me just ask you, Father, when you say windows, what do you mean exactly? Well, like um, conceptual windows, theological windows, political, or even just art. physical windows. Oh, physical windows. windows. <laughs> yeah. Adam put glass there yeah, right, so that right. people would feel free to come in and they could see what was going on. That's right. But I think there's also the sense of an openness, mm -hmm. you know, yes. an adjournamento uh, that yes. could happen that the Catholic tradition of the West and the specific Anglo Catholic tradition might allow. And I wanted yes. to hear that. I have a an idea about it, but I want to hear what you're saying, and I'll talk. Okay, well, I'm sort of tempted to ask you about what your idea is, but, um, <clears throat> well, this may not be what you're, what you're thinking of, but where my mind goes with that question, um, especially because you mentioned the mostly white Episcopal Church, um, is, was another part of Kreitz's interview, which I didn't get to, but, he basically says, he is again in 1979, and he makes this point, and, in fact, and then he says, but golly, you know, <clears throat> the worldwide Anglican communion is, is much less white, and it's changing rapidly. And of course, now we're 38 years down the stream of that, and it's, you know, vast majority non-white Anglican communion. And he, he, he thought this was a wonderful opportunity for what he called readjustment in thought processes on the part of um, Protestants and Europeans and Episcopalians and people in England and so forth. Um, and so I think that's true, you know. Um, writing this paper, I was, I was mindful of Rowan Williams because I know he was with you all not that long ago. And he's, of course, an Anglo-Catholic who's thought a lot about pretty much everything. But, um, he, about 10 years ago, when he was Archbishop of Canterbury, was talking about the present moment in the Anglican Communion as a, a Catholic moment in the Communion. And that was because we were all sort of awakening to one another more fully. Um, and I heard people on all sides of the spectrum of debate saying that kind of thing. As basically, any Anglican who traveled out around the Communion had got, gotten that kind of missionary bug for the great diversity of our own church. Um, and I think that would be a, one window. Um, by thinking more about the Anglican communion, its history, its different cultures and peoples, um, different kinds of Anglican saints that we have in parts of the global south, like um, the Ugandan martyrs, perhaps, or if we're interested in Anglo-Catholicism, some of the amazing things Anglo-Catholics did in South Africa are interesting. So. But kind of cottoning onto that larger global reality is a pedagogy within Anglicanism, and it, it explodes a kind of white Episcopal church, really. Um, and the other just brief thing would be, I don't think it's accidental, it's really built on that, is the ecumenical strand that runs through Christ's thinking. And, 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 and because he's a Catholic, he, he'll, he's not afraid of all cultures. So he's taking over the Indian. He wants us to study all of that and so forth. And I think a real fully, full-blown comprehensive Catholicism would kind of find a thoughtful, intelligent way of sifting all aspects of culture. 
Um, and of course, Cohn gets into this a lot in his later work. It's part of his whole spiritual sort of blues kind of a notion. Um, but so, yeah. But, but again, I would just say for Christ, I think as an Anglo-Catholic, and for Anglo-Catholics, we'd obviously want to knit it together in a way that told a Catholic doctrinal or, or liturgical story or sacramental story that would be unique to the Anglo-Catholic view. I don't know if that's helpful. What's your thought? <laughs> uh, because I see it less as a window that's based on doctrine, yeah. or theological reflection, yeah. but in this space and in the way we live our lives uh, as an interracial and sometimes an interfaith community. Yeah. Uh, I think it's very important that we look at the relationships between the aesthetic and the ethical. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. As it were, right. that we through beauty and discover truth, yes. and that's not to the top. And there's a way in which, uh, because we are all invested in the liturgy and its movement that goes that way, we sometimes see as everybody is uh, either side of us as the people that we belong together with. Yes. And that, that there's an equality in that. Yes. And so we're able to see the transitions come and go. Not always mm -hmm. easily. I mean, there are mm -hmm. obvious historical mm -hmm. flaws in our own history that we have had to overcome in this parish. But uh, I think the great engine for that has been the liturgical and the aesthetic, and that's produced a kind of ethical realization. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. there's theological reflection. Mm -hmm. But I see Christ, because I have known of his work, I guess, for many years, as the stations of the cross were very well known to me. Yes, yes. <coughs> and I think he obviously got caught up in that uh, yes. vision. That's right. No, that's good. Thank you. The ethical. Yeah. This idea of your uh, that you come is a synthesis of Cohn and Eliot of each community having to figure out their own uh, heresy and orthodoxy. At what level is that? Is that figured out? Is that figured out at the, the sort of the parish level, at the sort of <laughs> academic level, the, right. and, and you know which right. community sort of recognize that and calls it out? Yeah, great question. Well, yeah, they might say different kinds of things. I mean, um, you know, yeah, Elliot says an effort which should neither be wholly suppressed nor wholly left unchecked. <laughs> it doesn't really help us. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think, golly, I mean, um, so, uh, I think, um, you know, Eliot was one of the um, authors of a text presented to the Archbishop of Canterbury in the 30s, I believe, or 40s, called Catholicity. And it's a real kind of substantive proposal. It was a, the Archbishop of Canterbury's invitation to members of the Catholic party in the Church of England to make a proposal to him about how they viewed the world. And it was written by um, Austin Ferrer and mm. Eliot and L.S. Thornton and a bunch of luminaries. Michael Ramsey, when he was still at Durham, or maybe even a priest was one of the authors. Um, and um, in it, they have a kind of sustained, old-fashioned, like Catholicism with a capital C. That's also kind of Roman friendly, um, and it's it's very Augustinian, and it's like councils and bishops and things like that. So I doubt he would be too excited about it. kind of like willy-nilly um, local discernment of heresy and orthodoxy. So I think, I think we could safely put Elliot in a conservative camp there, if you will. Um, but, I mean, he still makes the historical point that you still need to continue discerning in history in, in a dynamic way. So you're not just sort of phoning in former doctrines. It's not like once you've figured out Christian doctrine, it's just, you know, you just put it on the shelf and you can get it out at any time because you need to speak to the dynamic realities. And to avoid all the different heresies, they, I mean, it's sort of a truism of Catholic theology that they're always going to come back at you in different ways and in different 
you know, you know, with different kind of lexicon and grammar so that you maybe don't see them coming from. Um, for Cohn, I think he's doing something much more radical. But, and I, I mean, I, I doubt he would be very excited about kind of like Eliot's Anglo-Catholic Global World Council full of bishops or something like that. But I'm proposing that Cohn's theological idea is still like a right one. And for kind of Catholic-minded types, they can interact with it. And I think, again, the right question would be, are there, I mean, people throw this, this kind of thing around, I would say carelessly, just insofar as they probably went five through it. But that doesn't mean it's wrong. Um, they'll say, well, the great American heresy is X. Or, you know, like, it's probably heretical to vote for this person. And people will say that on, on different sides. So that is kind of working with Cohn's notion. That, that there might be certain kind of local heretical things we need to be concerned about. Um, I would just propose that if, if we're going to... I myself... As an old-fashioned Thomist, I'm enthusiastic about talking about heresy and orthodoxy. I think it's really important and not boring or offensive or anything like that. Because Christians should try to try to be orthodox. Um, and it's hard not to be heretical, um, of course. I mean, Aquinas says most of us like are heretical accidentally when we are trying to articulate the faith. But then we, but we're meaning to be orthodox. And then people correct us and we're like, oh, thank you. you know? So that's different than the kind of like formal public heretic. But so, so if you're interested in Christian teaching and Christian doctrine, then you're going to be interested in heresy and orthodoxy. I think, so I think it's really a, a good question. I just think it, by definition, you have to debate it. And, and if you're playing the Catholic game, the wider the consensus, the better. So you're really, it's really not a definitive determination of heresy or orthodoxy that's at the congregational level. Or even the denomination, sorry. I mean, it has to be broader than that. But it's a good place to start. That's where local councils happen and where local saints are honored. It all starts at the local level. So you need the dynamic between the local and the universal in every aspect of the church. We have time for one more. And then uh, during the uh, reception, you can, I'm sure, that Christopher would invite your questions and interactions. So is there, is there one last one before we head to the reception? Probably you. Just. Well, this is just to contribute to uh, your discernment of, of where James Cohn might stand yes. in all of this. Um, I would say that later this year there will be published a memoir uh, from which we've already heard a few extracts in the context of marking James' passing. He, he, he knew that he was coming to the end of his life and he was able to, to write a memoir about his theological journey, which I think will be very helpful in answering some of the questions that you've raised. For, where I would say Jim was, he, he was a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is a very thoughtful, very intellectual tradition within African American Christianity. He didn't have a strong ecclesiology, is my understanding. His vision was of the theologian as the public voice. Mm -hmm. And I think we will see that in the memoir as we see it in the other books. And so the work of the theologian was not for him to stand in relation to places of authority, which might be a, a, a reputable Catholic way to look at it, but right. rather, to be, rather to be a prophetic voice to which the community must hold itself accountable. So that would be a suggestion at any rate of how perhaps to read that, that challenge. Thank you very much, Professor Cameron, that's helpful. Okay, uh, thank you very much.